And then one more time today, let's head to the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 3, beginning at verse 14 through 22 to the church in Laodicea. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Beloved congregation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Laodicea, the Luke warm church, the one that fills Jesus Christ with disgust, the one that we talk about to be neither hot nor cold, and then we look at ourselves and we say, are we that church? But what does it mean that they are lukewarm? And also there is that interesting conversation between Jesus and that church that says, I am knocking, let me in, eat with me. And you will overcome and you will be victorious. But what does that mean that Jesus is knocking at the door? And what does it mean that the church in Laodicea has to let them in? Again, Laodicea historically uh, might be the easiest church in a way to understand some of the metaphor, some of uh, the way that Jesus speaks. So it's located on three major highways. And it's the last place that you would spend coming out of town uh, from Asia to get to Ephesus to do your major work of retail or banking or whatever it is you want to do, or to get out and then get yourself off to Rome through that harbor. In its valleys were sheep of black wool. Its wool was known all over the Roman Empire as being the best, the softest, the most beautiful. They also had a flourishing textile industry. They had a great tourism industry as well, and it was a place where people could stop and spend the night and get good food and drink and wine and women and song and all kinds of lascivious things that went with Greek culture. But it was a church, or rather it was a city that basically everybody got along. It was humming right right along. Everybody was making coin. It seemed like pretty much everybody was rich there. And we've seen in the different churches that the church kind of takes on the character of the city that they live in. So when you get converted, you still are who you are. We're still Canadians. We're Christian Canadians. What does that mean? And and sometimes that becomes difficult, you know, because you you look at the churches in the United States. And sometimes, like myself, I was trained in the United States. But the church is different there than here. And Canadians are different than Americans. Sometimes you have to go live in the States to find out you actually are Canadian. What is a Canadian? But we're kind and we're decent. And for the most part, we, we get along and, and we're about security and, and about, you know, not making too many waves. We live our lives and we keep our head down and stay in our lanes. And so Canadians are not necessarily known as being too aggressive or, or being too wimpy on the other hand. They are are known for certain amounts of courage and strength. But what is a Canadian and and who are we? And who are we as Christian Canadians? And, And what is the church like in Canada? And so these words come to us in in a very powerful way. Now, if you went to Laodicea, there was a massive aqueduct there and it brought all the water in. Now, if you would go to Hierapolis which was just a short mile away, and it's easy, right, because Hierapolis starts with H, it had very hot water. It had medicinal water. It had soothing 
water that came. And if you went to the other side of Laodicea, there was Colossa Sea, and it had very cold water, refreshing water, water that, that quenched thirst. And in the middle of all of that, you have Laodicea with its tepid, horrible, useless, terrible tasting water. And yet into that place, Jesus Christ had placed a church. But this church is in big trouble. This church is blind and it's naked and it fills Jesus with disgust. It's the only place, you know, that, that we read in the New Testament that that word disgust, you disgust me, I want to spew you out of my mouth. And so we need to listen this afternoon as one more time the covenant king comes to his covenant people there in Laodicea and here in Rexdale. And our theme then will be Jesus, the great I am, the truth bearer, calls a lukewarm church in Laodicea to repent. We'll see there, first of all, the condemnation of being lukewarm and who they are. Then the council, repent, turn back, be earnest, open the door, and then comfort. I will allow you to sit on the throne with me on my father's throne. So we look at the king again who comes, and this time we see that he is the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. So the church in Laodicea was having difficulty looking in the mirror and seeing the truth about themselves. So now Jesus is going to come and say, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, I am going to bear witness against you. What I say to you is Amen. So surely it is so. It is the truth, verily, verily, truly, truly, amen and amen. What I say to you now, you better listen to because this is who you are. And by the way, I am the ruler of the whole world. I am the ruler of the creation. It's interesting that he uses those words, right? The ruler of God's creation. And then we think of water this afternoon and we're going to talk about sheep and textile and all the things that they they thought that they had control of because they manipulated them and made a lot of money out of them. But Jesus says, I am the king of creation. You need to listen to me. So if I can run this through, right? Jesus, the great amen, calls the lukewarm church in Laodicea to repent. Ultimately, what the sin is, they are the kingdom of God without the king. That they think they can do the work of Jesus Christ without him. So this morning we were talking in catechism class and my three catechism students, by God's grace, are going to make their profession of faith, the Lord willing, next Sunday. And when you do that, you don't say, okay, now I'm saved. And now, Lord God, I'm going to take care of this work for you on my behalf. No, we need to finally say, Lord, we need you to work through us. We need to be dependent upon you. We need you to be active in us. And Jesus says, I know your deeds, and I'm not active in you. You're not letting me be active in you. I know your deeds, and you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. And we talked a little bit about that, but at least with hot water, there, there is a spa activity with it. it. It takes away aches and pains. It's comforting, especially in terms of bathing, but also for our food and for our drink and boiling things. Hot water is, is good. It, it, it's something. It, it's definitive. And cold water, too to have something to drink, to refresh us, to splash our face with on a hot day. It's definitive. It has character. We know what it is, whether it's cold or whether it's hot. But Laodicea, I don't know what you are. You're, you're not the kind of church that's giving a glass of cold water to the spiritually thirsty. And you're not bringing healing of hot water to the spiritually ailing. You're nothing. And if we go further, the problem in Laodicea, and we talked a little bit about this morning, but now we need to go a little further, is the church in Laodicea did not exist for God 
and for his glory or for the work of Jesus Christ, nor did the church in Laodicea exist for the well-being of the city of Laodicea. It existed for the well-being of itself. And here's the danger when a church becomes somewhat successful and when a church lives in a world that is, in terms of wealth, thriving. So when a church becomes institutional, and we have to be honest with that, we are somewhat institutional. We have forms. We celebrate the Lord's Supper a certain way according to a church order and according to our liturgical forms. There's a way that ministers get trained. This morning we installed a pastor and an elder in a certain way. We have clubs and we have societies and we have catechism and we have worship and worship happens a certain way. And we have people, chairmen, and we have vice chairmen and we have records. And, and actually if you go in this building you can find old records still in Dutch. And all of these things, they can be important to the church in the normal way of running a church, but it can take on a life of itself so that we become church simply to be church for us. Church is a place where our guys and girls can meet their marriage partner, where we can sit together and see our grandchildren grow up where we can take care of each other and that we make sure that, that we don't ruffle too many feathers or, or that we don't shake the world too much because, well, then the world's going to come back and shake us. I remember once being in a, in a church and I was sitting outside talking to some people from the town. They called them townies. And I was asked by the elders, what were you doing? I said, well, I was talking to them, inviting them to church. And they said, why would you do that? If they come to church, our church is going to be rocked. And it went, wow, what happens to us? And so the warning comes, be careful with it. Be careful with who we are. That Jesus would never say of us, as he says to Laodicea, you're bland, you're tepid. You're useless to me. That's really what he says. And you fill me with disgust. And I will spew you out of my mouth. And there you see the covenant again. Jesus is the covenant king. And he says, you are my people. And I have saved you. And I have redeemed you. And I have given my life for you. I died on the cross for you. Not so you could be flat. Not so you go, eh. You know, it's kind of cool being a Christian. And for the most part... Actually, a Christian worldview helps me in business and, and helps me make some money and it and makes my family life a little bit better. But are we on fire for Jesus? And you know, even this week I was reading about what happens to us as ministers. And what often happens to us as ministers is we become very much part of the fabric of the institution. In fact, we can become the essence of the institution itself. So that, and this happened to me in my life, that I began to define myself not as a child of God, not as a redeemed son of the king, not as the one who was saved by grace through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I defined myself by being a minister of the church of Jesus Christ. I became a professional Christian. I got paid to be a Christian. I got paid to do the work of the church, which isn't necessarily the same thing as doing the work of Jesus Christ. And I became flat. And then I started thinking, well, God must have subcontracted Bazillion to do his work. And then I could just hand that work back. And then when it went bad, who was there to blame but me? And I remember sitting at a class in McMaster University where the professor asked us, what do you do? I said, well, I teach catechism. I write two sermons a week. I visit the poor and the sick and help people with marriage issues. I go to consistory meetings and I go to deacon meetings and I visit the elderly and, and I take care of this. And he said, whoa, whoa, whoa. He said, that's really interesting, Al. And then he said, what's Jesus doing in your ministry? And I remember just sitting there with my mouth open going, I'm not sure. Because I thought I could do it. And then you become lukewarm because you're passionate for the things of self and church, but not on fire for the things of the gospel, not on fire for the things of the people back then in St. Catharines or here in Rexdale. It's always right there for us. Israel always had this, didn't they? Every time that they, they finally were being obedient and then the Lord blessed them, we just uh, sang of it or read it together, was 
Psalm 144, blessed are the people who, who have lots of flocks and the mountains are filled with fruit and everything's going well. And somehow it, it just kind of sucks the life out of us. And that we kind of become fat and, and a little bit lazy. And, and, and we look at ourselves and, and we go to the congregational meeting and boy, we made the budget again. And, and we're making sure everything's done. But the passion's not there. And Jesus sees that. And so we need to be very careful to listen to this. Moses wrote this, Do not defile yourselves in any of these ways, because this is how the nations that I am going to drive out before you became defiled. Even the land was defiled, so I punished it for their sins. And the land vomited out its inhabitants. But it would help if you keep my decrees and my laws. The native-born and the aliens among you must not do any of these detestable things, for all these things were done by the people who lived in the land before you, and the land became defiled. And if you defile the land, I will vomit you out, as I vomited out the nations before you. So Jesus goes on and he says, look, I, I know your deeds. You were neither cold nor hot. I'm, I'm vomiting you out. You've become like the world to me. You say I am rich. I have acquired wealth. I don't need a thing. You know why that's interesting? In AD 60, Laodicea was destroyed by an earthquake. And the Roman Senate gave them all kinds of money to rebuild the city. And the town council in Laodicea said, we don't actually need your money. And they gave it back. We can take care of ourselves. If you asked anybody in Laodicea, they would say, I am rich. But they said this in the church. We don't need your care, king of the creation. We don't need all of your stuff. We, we have enough on our own. We are self-supporting. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Maybe some of you remember that story by Hans Christian Anderson about the emperor who had no clothes and this emperor was quite full of himself and then he hired uh, some uh, boys to uh, create a, a beautiful robe for him and they actually tricked him into believing that a uh, robe that was made of nothing that he paid for and he put on that he was walking around naked that he looked amazing in and he strutted around looking until some boys in the parade started snickering and laughing and said the emperor has no clothes he's walking around naked Jesus is laying them naked. Remember, this is the textile center of the Roman Empire, the best clothes in the world in the Roman Empire, the best wool in the Roman Empire, the richest people in the Roman Empire. And Jesus says, look, you're pitiful, you're wretched, you're naked, you got nothing in front of me. I see you. Do you see yourself? Do you understand who you are? It's not about the church building you built. It's not about the pipe organ you've got. It's not about the beautiful grand piano that you have. It's not about the Christian school that you built. It's about me. You need me. And any of this stuff that you have is because I gave it to you. Do you not understand? But Jesus, in spite of all that warning, is a king who loves his people. He's a shepherd who loves his sheep. He is the husband who loves his bride. But, he says, I'm not done with you yet. There is still hope. Heed my counsel, he says. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich. Can you imagine them hearing that? Come on. We are rich. No, you're not. You're not because you don't have me. I am not the burning fire in your lives. I'm not the one who has refined and purified the kind of gold that you need. Now, it's obviously metaphorical. He's speaking about the wealth and the riches that come with belonging to the Savior, Jesus Christ, from the spiritual benefits of the wealth that comes to belong to the Lord and Lord of King and Kings. He says, you don't have it, but buy from me. Take the gold that I give you. Look, we didn't even need Rome's gold to rebuild you need mine, Jesus says. And we need to hear that. We who have built our little empires and have made our money. and It's an interesting thing to hear. 
you wretched, pitiful, poor, and blind, buy gold refined in the fire from me, and then become rich. And white clothes to wear, not the black wool, not the dark clothes that Laodicea was famous for, but I want you to put on my white robes. There it is again, white robes, righteousness, washed in the blood of Jesus, purified from my sins. I can stand before Almighty God. We sang it this morning. By the sea of crystal, saints in glory stand, myriads of number drawn in every land, wearing white robes and waving palms of victory. You can't buy this stuff. You can't make this stuff. Jesus gives it. Take it from him. Hold on to what he gives so you can cover your shameful nakedness. I see you, Jesus says. And that hits us, doesn't it? Like, what does Jesus see in the covenant reformed church? But what does he see when he sees us every day and he looks at us? And and I can wear my suit and a tie and all that kind of stuff. But I think the hardest part, you know, because it is to the angel, and that's why we keep bringing up the ministers, but again, this week I was reading about the, the double life of a minister, what the wife and the kids see of the man who the congregation might see as a nice guy, as that helpful pastor, as the one who really comforted me, and then he goes home and he's a miserable so-and-so. He sees us. I need the robes of white. And that's also true for us. We need those robes of white. If we can more and more here see ourselves as rich in Christ and saved by the death of Christ, our our witness is going to be profound. We're not who we are because we hold to certain doctrinal truths, first of all, or because we have the three forms of unity, first of all, or because we have reformed in the name, first of all. You know, part of the problem in Laodicea, this is the church of Jesus Christ in Laodicea, but Jesus Christ isn't even allowed in. But if Christ burns in us, and that passion comes, and where does that passion come? I'm, I'm, I'm righteous before Almighty God, who knows I'm a sinner, and decides to forget my sins. Wow. That is beauty. That is amazing. And then what does he say? He says, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Doesn't that seem a little bit odd? So in Laodicea, there was one of the most important schools of medicine. And one of the things that that school of medicine was known for was the powder of Phrygia. And it was a salve that you put on your eyes and it solved many kinds of uh, visual problems and even in certain cases, blindness. And many people would flock to Laodicea, to that school of medicine, to get this. I mean, Jesus is saying, you say you're rich, you need my gold. You say you've got great clothing, you need what I'm going to give you. You say you've got medicine for your eyes, you need me. I will open your eyes. And if I open your eyes, at first it's going to be, oh no, I don't know that I wanted to see that. But as we begin to see Christ and who he is and him crucified and him dead and his resurrection and all of the great truths, then our life will be great to those whom I love, rebuke, and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Hebrews chapter 12, he disciplines the ones that he loves. The church there is is hearing these things, this teaching, the strong words of Jesus, even to the point, if you continue in this, it's over for you. I will spew you out of my mouth if you don't heat up or cool down or something. But come to me. And take what I will give you. So now how do we do that? Well, again, you you have all of that rootedness in Revelation into the prophets. And again, the prophet of Isaiah. This morning, Isaiah 22. Now Isaiah 55. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the riches of fare. Here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. 
And if anyone hears my voice and open the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Look, we're not seeing here a Jesus, a helpless Jesus who is just hoping that you're going to choose him. What he is saying is to that church, you have the name, the Church of Jesus Christ of Laodicea, but I'm not even allowed on the pulpit. I'm not even invited into your worship service. I'm hardly mentioned. Here I am. Open the door to me. Let me in. Let me do my work through you. And we will eat and drink and we will fellowship. We will have intimate fellowship because in the Middle East and in the ancient Near East, uh, I mean, what was more personable than to eat with a king? To eat with the king of creation? No Roman emperor was going to say, come and eat at my table. No king was going to say that. No prelate or governor. Our prime minister is very rarely going to say, hey, why don't you come to my house? And yet next week, the Lord Jesus says, come to the table and fellowship with me. I'm knocking. And it best not be as the song goes, I hear you knocking, but you can't come in. We need to throw open the door to Jesus in the church to let in the, the fresh breezes, the, the burning fire, the, the cooling of the healing, the salve that will open our eyes, the one who will come with new clothes. You, you think of that, that parable that Jesus told in Matthew 22 where uh, there was a the king, right, and he was going to give a banquet in, in honor of his son, and he invited all the citizens, and the citizens, oh, yeah, I'm too busy, you know, I just got married, and uh, I've just bought a cow, and I've got to get it ready. And finally he said, oh, yeah, then enough of you. You're not invited. You're not going to come. So he goes into the streets, and he invites the dregs of society and the hitchhikers and all of those people, and he dresses them up so that they sit at the banquet. But then there's one man sitting in there with, with a lousy pair of clothes on, and he said, how did you get in here? And he casts him off into the place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. We have been invited to the banquet. Now, would we sit there at the banquet hall and then shut the door to Jesus? Or will we come now? You who are burdened, heavy laden. You who are naked. You who are destitute. You who are spiritually poor. You who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Come by and eat. Why are you spending all your money on the stuff that doesn't satisfy? Just come to the Lord and he will provide it for you. And then the heat heats up. And then the passion grows. And the cool healing of the spirit grows in us and we become something new and something different and something changed. And then he comforts us because a covenant always comes that way. If you walk with me, I'll walk with you. If you eat with me, I'm going to bless you. If you overcome, if you're victorious, if you get passionate again, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne as I was victorious and sat down with my father on the throne. That means we're going to have to die to sin. That means we're going to have to crucify the old man. That we're going to have to be still in the death of the grave. That we're going to have to put to death all this worldly passion. And getting back to a Canadian again. You know, maybe Canadians are not known for being that passionate and easily asking for forgiveness. I think I've said that before, at least in a Bible study class, but do you know why the Canadian crossed the road? To get to the middle. That's what they say about us. But we, we're not about getting to the middle now. We're getting to the place where we need to show Canadians about true passion in life. To overcome all of the pressures on us to conform in this society to listen to what the elitists are telling us and to be badgered for the things that we believe. And, and we will. The, the stronger we stand for it, the more passionate we are about it, well, the more passionate they will come against us. But as we heard this morning in Philadelphia, when they stood, Jesus loved them. And so we listened then. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. And whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. 
Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. You will live. You will be victorious. You will not only rule forever and ever, you will rule now with Jesus Christ if we will overcome. Now again, when we go through these letters of the churches, we see the king speaking to us. And the things that were happening in those seven churches, losing your first love, giving in to the sins of the world, standing up for Jesus Christ no matter what, knowing that persecution will come and we will not be raptured out of it, nor are we told to flee it. But to be in the world and not of the world and to burn brightly for Jesus Christ. And in each one of those churches there was an angel, a minister, who was to represent these things and to present these things and to hold on to these things himself together with the leadership of the church. Where Jesus says, I am your king. I am your redeemer. I am your savior. I am your shepherd Be my people, be my sheep, be my citizens. Be the redeemed people of God. Love me as I've loved you. And it will go well with you. For lo, I am with you. Ministers come and ministers go. But Jesus says, I will be with you even to the end of the age. Let the churches hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And may we grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, receiving his gold, putting on the robes of righteousness that he's given to us, washed in his blood, with eyes opened through the spiritual salve that he gives that we can see and understand and live and burn with passion for our Lord and for our King as Christian Canadians, as Christian Torontonians, as members of the kingdom, as we walk with the king on the king's highway. Amen. Let's pray. Father, walk with us and go with us. Help our unbelief. Change us. Mold us. Make us after your will. Be our vision, Lord of our heart. Not else to me save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night, waking or sleeping, your presence our sight. High King of heaven, our victory won, may we reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's sun, heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be our vision, our ruler of all. In Jesus' name, amen.